Going to Mars is not ambitious enough. It's the mere substance of the species. It's not greatness. When we get to Mars, what will we do? What will we exclude? What will we regulate? What will we aspire to? Going to Venus? You can't create by looking for it sources of meaning. It has to be reflected back to you in the world you live in. The project of sending us all to Mars or building ChatGPT. Nietzsche would regard that as so naive, so low-minded, devoid of any kind of genuine greatness. As a civilizational project, if you aspire nothing more than to a beautiful house with a view of the ocean, a very nice car, you're what Nietzsche would call a herd animal. Nothing but a concatenation of ideals conceived from social media television, movies. Maybe there's a 200, 400 year dark age coming, but what you're doing is preservationist. You're, you're keeping alive the capacity to read these difficult texts with patience, finesse, and love. That's our task right now. My guest, Robert Pippin, is one of the great philosophers of our age. But you're going to hear why he's turned away from philosophy and towards literature and film for meaning. The topic of our discussion today is Friedrich Nietzsche, who expressed very similar discontents about traditional philosophy. Now, Nietzsche became disillusioned with academic philosophy because he thought it was impotent in resolving one of the most important challenges of our age, nihilism. Now, nihilism might sound like a merely theoretical problem, but it's a disease that can hollow out your life from the inside, even if everything externally is going well. Why are more and more people becoming disillusioned with modernity when every measurable metric, life expectancy, productivity, representation, are all going up? Why do many feel empty, even in careers that provide challenging and well-paid work? It's because the primary threat to living a good life in the 21st century is no longer external, right? Will I survive? Will I starve? But it's internal. What pursuits will give my life meaning? Now, as an example, the best periods of my own life have all been marked by an all-consuming desire. And the worst periods weren't when that desire was thwarted, because that still gives me orientation and energy. It's when there's no desire to begin with. Falling in love and having your heart broken is preferable to not feeling anything at all. This is what nihilism threatens. It threatens these life-orienting commitments that you can't help but feel pulled by. Nihilism, then, is an inability to desire. It's an erectile dysfunction, but of the soul. In this interview, you're going to learn why the traditional sources of meaning have dried up and how Nietzsche proposed to overcome nihilism. Let's begin uh, with definition. What is Nietzsche's understanding of nihilism, this thing that we are uh, plagued by in modernity? Uh, nihilism means nothing is true, everything is allowed. Um, that the confidence we had that we could discover the truth and that we could regulate our conduct in common by a commitment to a certain set of core values had collapsed. But nihilism actually had a tradition before, before Nietzsche. It's an 18th century word um, that was popularized by a, a philosopher, theologian, novelist named Friedrich Jacobi in his anxiety about the optimism of the Berlin Enlightenment, people like Kant. Uh, he believed that the, the foundation of Christian Western society um, since, since the Middle Ages had been religion. Um, the orienting principle of life had been basic tenets of Christian morality, and that the, uh, the insistence by people like Kant on uh, rational autonomy in human life would succeed in undermining the, the sort of inspiring qualities of uh, religion, especially in, in Germany, the Protestant religion, and that the collapse of this belief in religious value would mean the collapse of all confidence that we knew how we should live. If you ask yourself, what are the major sources of meaning in contemporary life that, that, uh, where people feel their lives potentially fulfilled? Um, of course, they have to do with things like romantic love, the nuclear family, um, security, peaceableness, and essentially freedom, as people understand it. That is, freedom to direct the course of my own life as I see fit. And Nietzsche regards all of those as um, incomplete. Nietzsche thinks most of our commitments are really just surface commitments. I mean, yeah, people are committed to the nuclear family, but they get divorced. People are committed to their work, but then their work exhausts them, and they see themselves as working for the profit of, of others. People are 
Uh, some people are still committed to religion, but they see around them a world that does not reflect back to them the significance of their religious lives. And they get very angry. They think they've lost something that we could politically restore. All those kind of phenomena that go back to the question of the sources of meaning. And the sources of meaning, they've dried up. This is a phenomenon Nietzsche was interested in from the very beginning of his career with the death of a form of life in Greek culture, the, the tragic way of life, the way in which tragic poetry had formed the core of the pre-Greek Enlightenment uh, life of Athens especially. He saw the same thing happening in late Western society that he saw happening with the moment of the Socratic Enlightenment in Greek culture. So what I take nihilism to be is an inability to form these life-orienting commitments. That's the core issue. And you know, maybe to relate this to my own life and share with our audience why I'm so excited to discuss your book with you. Um, when I graduated college, I went into the technology industry, the startup industry, because I thought it was one of the last realms of sincerity in the West today that you could say with a straight face, I want to build a starship that takes us to Mars and hire a thousand people who worked a hundred hour weeks in total belief and immersion. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, I think most realms in the West are not like that. Academia is very self-critical, finan finance is very cynical. What I wanted entering into the technology was that type of ability to, to devote myself, to throw myself into something. So I did that. I went and built a, uh, built a tech company. And then for some mysterious reason, three years later, I lost that ability, that, that ability to devote myself. And that was kind of my sign that I had to move on. And so then I started this project. I still had the burning passion for philosophy. And now I wake up, uh, you know, sometimes in the middle of the night, so excited about what I'm going to do um, that, I, that, I, that I can't fall back to sleep. But it's, it's that sense of commitment and devotion that mm -hmm. I was chasing. Is that a good understanding of, of what nihilism is threatening to take away? Your personal experience, it's, it's a very parallel kind of phenomenon. But I think what, what interests Nietzsche is that these, um, this kind of orientation and commitment can't really be understood in kind of isolation as something true only of a personal life history. It has something to do with the enterprises available to you as sources of mattering or meaningfulness in late Western modern society. If you would imagine Nietzsche considering somebody passionately committed to the project of sending us all to Mars or building a chat box, a, a chat GPT or something like that, he would regard that as so naive, so low-minded, uh, so devoid of any kind of genuine greatness as a civilizational project, not just as a personal project. So that these two things are interconnected. Uh, uh, the fact that Nietzsche devotes so much of his attention to modern culture, to modernity as a problem, um, which he says in many of his books is his chief problem, problem of modernity, means the sources for this dissatisfaction, even though they can arise personally in an existential way, are, are, are not just isolated to, they have to do with what's available as avenues of meaningfulness. So another way to frame your response is, uh, Jonathan, this does manifest, obviously, in individuals, but there's a social, cultural component to this about what uh, means are about what passions you can fully devote yourself to. Right. Um, you can't be a sincere aristocrat anymore because the right. institution right. of the aristocracy right. is, is no more. Um, I want to say that is probably why philosophy might be the only uh, devotion I could see myself uh, devoted to right now is because philosophy promises to, to tell me where I can throw myself. So I, I'm devoting to finding a devotion or I'm committing to find, to find a commitment, if that makes sense. Let me ask you one question. So when Nietzsche talks about great historical enterprises, he has the Goethe's and the, and the, uh, the Beethoven's in mind. Mm -hmm. and, and your claim is that he wouldn't think of our, any of our technological pro progress to be in that category. Is that right? Yeah, I think Nietzsche thinks of the modern prophets of progress as he says, as ascetic priests are still committed to a kind of religious faith in the power of a commitment to something like knowing the truth, that, that these modern technocrats and medical researchers and uh, you know, computer scientists and so forth believe they've found a kind of truth about human life, a very kind of low-minded, especially in terms of contemporary economy, economistic theory, a very low-minded conception of the rationalization of society that they have faith in. But Nietzsche has no hope that will actually sustain a, a meaningful commitment over a civilizational project because the, the ambition is so low for survivability. 
security, right, right, right. prosperity, right. peace, not being bothered, what he called wretched contentment. Right. So the funny conclusion might be that going to Mars is not ambitious enough or what you're aiming for well, when you're trying way. to go to Mars is, 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 so there, there, is about your, your basic self substance right? It's the mere substance of the species. It's not way. greatness. When we get to Mars, what will we do? Right, right. What will we read? What will we teach our children? Right, what, right. What will we exclude? What will we regulate? What will we aspire to? And maybe there... Going to Venus? <laughs> right. and, and maybe there you actually helped diagnose. I said I didn't know why my sort of devotion for technology quickly died out. As you said, given the ambition, the outward ambition of these yeah. projects, of transhumanism, of, of space flight, of artificial intelligence, the reasons that people are pursuing these things are quite, like you said, low-minded. Yeah. And maybe that's why... Um, I wasn't able to sustain that commitment. The most extreme example I can think of here is I have a friend who's a very successful uh, fund manager. So he's at the top of the capitalistic mm -hmm. pecking order. And the thing he wants most is to go to war. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't, he isn't just hoping for, you know, a small war. He's hoping for a war that's going to threaten the North, North America yeah. because he can devote himself existentially to it. And I think this quote probably uh, from Nietzsche directly is going to tie together a lot of things that we discuss. He who has a why can bear with almost any how. Man does not seek happiness, only the English man does. Right. That's yeah. one of my favorite yeah. <laughs> lines of Nietzsche. Yeah. And it ties together not only the first part, he who has a why can, can, can bear with almost any how, the importance of meaning and the, the, the relatively lack of importance of everything compared to meaning. Like my friend, the fund manager, who has everything except for meaning. And the second part perhaps gives us a clue of why meaning is lost. The Englishman uh, for Nietzsche is this sort of pet, petty, low-minded uh, technocrat, mm -hmm. right? Who's interested in calculating utils, the classic utilitarians as he, he has in target here. And it's that form of bourgeois low-mindedness that is the reason for the loss of meaning. Well, that's an interesting example because I think what your friend meant is he wants to test himself. He wants to see you know, whether he'll be courageous, whether he'll be willing to sacrifice himself, whether he'll be willing to take risks that aren't just risks in uh, placing a, a bet on a certain turn in the market, um, but risk his life so that he, he can figure out, can test. Because we can think of ourselves as committed to a whole bunch of things that we actually are committed to only through massive forms of self-deceit a way of convincing ourselves we're satisfied when we know we're not. And this expression of your, your friend that he's, he's worried that what he thinks he's committed to he might not be willing to risk his life for, and he'd like to find out, is a telling example of the kind, it could be the kind of thing Nietzsche would say. Right, that's very interesting. Now, I want to help our, our audience understand nihilism in another way. Another word you use to describe life and life's core commitments is erotic. What does it mean to view life as being fundamentally erotic? Yeah. Well, this, this goes back to the right kind of way of reading Nietzsche. Nietzsche wants, as he says from the very beginning of his career, to do philosophy from the perspective of life. And that means, what do we need to know in order to live well? It's a very, very Socratic question. And the way he puts that is by asking us whether the forms of knowledge that we seek, what we seek to, what we seek to become committed to or passionate to, can be einverleibt, incorporated, embodied, from the perspective of life, that is something like a gamble. Um, I mean, you've you've taken a gamble. You've you've left your your tech company, and you're doing. You have no idea whether this will turn out to be satisfying or not. Um, but this embodies a kind of perspective of life approach. Nietzsche didn't want to do traditional philosophy. Didn't want to have traditional positions. He wanted a revolutionary new approach to how to think about ways of living, experiments in living, like you're undertaking yourself. What I'm hearing in your answer is that for life to be erotic or for life's commitments to be erotic, it's from a first, first person and not third person perspective. Exactly. When I'm erotically attracted to someone, it's not because of, I don't know, listing a series of attributes about the person that makes me attracted to them. It's the felt phenomenological ex experience of that. And I had a friend here who was dating a girl who really ticked all of his boxes. But for some reason, he didn't have that sort of passionate desire. And he kept asking, can I work the machine? It's in reference to Pascal. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you know that the Christian God is the right one, can you work the machine? Can you habituate yourself into a sort of faith? Yeah. And despite all of his attempts, he couldn't work the machine. And so 
that's one of the things that we mean. And so when we say that life is erotic or life's core commitments are erotic, are we also saying that they're not grounded on reason in any strong sense? Yeah, I mean, lots of people know that things matter to them that they're embarrassed about. They would prefer that they don't matter, and they could actually take steps not to realize what actually happens to matter to them. Or they think there are things that should matter to them, like your, your friend, or like somebody who thinks that opera ought to matter to them. And so they go to the opera and they read the librettos and they read the history of opera because they want to be a cultured. But you know, at the end of the day, they go to the opera, but it doesn't matter to them. The hidden sources of the things that really matter to us are actually instinctual and uh, circumvent consciousness, reason, rationality, reflection, endorsement. So this theory of life's commitments as erotic, on one hand, it's contrasted against a sort of uh, Aristotelian habituation, right? The idea that if you just keep doing something, you're going to gain a sort of erotic desire to it. But it's also against a, I don't know, Platonic, Kantian, reason-based uh, form of uh, grounding of commitments, right? That we can reason to these first principles, and that's what justifies our commitments. So what is at the ground of life's commitments for Nietzsche? Well, I don't think Nietzsche thinks the, the idea of giving an answer to that question in kind of propositional terms is, is an adequate one. We have to look for examples in the past that are inspiring kind of exemplars of civilizational projects. People like uh, Pericles or Thucydides or uh, Aeschylus or Sophocles or, um, you know, the, the great epic poets. Um, Nietzsche was trained as a, as a classicist. And so that, that led him to a more kind of aesthetic view of life. This is a, a great difficulty of teaching Nietzsche. Students all want to know at the end of the course, well, what should we do? I mean, if it's all collapsed and we can't rely on the traditional reflective models of uh, endorsement, um, what are we left with? And I think Nietzsche is trying to, to, to present the situation as exactly the one we have to accept. And the things that emerge as kind of virtues for him are things like courage, honesty, um, straightforwardness, authenticity. Those are not things that can be given a kind of programmatic way. I wanted to double click on um, what you said about finding exemplars in the past. And let me begin by reading a quote from your book. Since nihilism amounts to this erotic failure, not ignorance or delusion, addressing it properly becomes quite difficult because as noted, one cannot be convinced that one ought to have a desire. That desire ought not to fail and thereby acquire it or sustain it. The most one might be able to do is offer oneself as an example of such an escape. As a Girardian, when I think about desire and what is at the core of desire is imitation, right? Girard has this idea of mimetic desire that we imitate those whom we consider to have a, a greater degree of being. And that's where, that's where the real root of desire is. Is Nietzsche perhaps saying something similar when he talks about offering oneself as, as, as an example or what you were just saying about rescuing uh, the Pericles of the world back as these cultural <clears throat> models. I, is that, instead of the habituation or reason, a potential third ground for how we might uh, inspire eroticism? Well, certainly not habituation, because Nietzsche considers habituation a kind of deadening of the spirit, mm. uh, a kind of a way of going to sleep, a way of narcoticizing ourselves. Um, and as we've been discussing, he doesn't think that our confidence that relying on rational self-reflection <clears throat> will actually get us very far. It, it fragments into contrasting camps. Now, Gerard, very interesting example here, because as you know, uh, Gerard's narrative was that once we had sort of the divine God as a, a kind of model of imitative desire, and then we had the aristocrats, and then when aristocratic culture collapsed, we, we became much more interested in what other people were doing, and desire became imitative in a kind of democratized, bourgeois way. But at the same time, we also realized that they weren't worthy of imitation and a certain form of self-hatred occurred. That's in a way very similar to what he, Nietzsche calls the sort of collapse of society into a herd animal. Um, when one settles on something that is inspiring and one strives to realize that one has a kind of erotic commitment to a projected way of life, is willing to accept the risks we were talking about before, the gamble, it inevitably conflicts with what others have set themselves on a path to achieve. It's agonistic. It's agonistic. And the question Nietzsche wants to raise is how much conflict are we willing to tolerate in order 
not to collapse into a reduction of ambition for the sake of security and peaceableness. Um, he thinks we're much too willing to compromise, to avoid conflictual situations. And this gets to, in a way, the kind of limitations of Nietzsche for a modern democratic or post-democratic society. Nietzsche is an elitist. He believes that the kinds of things we're talking about um, are available, if they're available, only for a small percentage of the population. Right, that's very interesting. So let's move to this, the second part, to talk about the explicit causes of this nihilism, which again is this uh, h historical issue. So when I read your book, there seemed to be two large causes. One is a surplus of truth, and another is a deficiency of self-contempt. So let's talk about the first one first. I quote to you your book. Nietzsche seems most interested in the discovery that truth, in the platonic sense, does not, cannot do for us what our hopes had held out, end quote. What did we hope that truth would do for us, and how has truth failed? The Socratic ideal is that the only serious question in human life is what is the best human life. Um, and Socrates thought he, the answer was trying to find out. The, the philosophical life is the only serious life worth. But Socrates also realizes that that life can be exhausting, that there is no resolution. Most people's experience with philosophy in college is of an enterprise that never leads anywhere. Frustrating. Frustrating, that there isn't any set of answers at the back of the book or something like that. Um, so, um, so in a way, there's something deeply Nietzschean about the Socratic aspiration to be able to live a kind of life that tolerates that dissatisfaction for the journey itself. But Nietzsche doesn't think there's any reason to believe that, that doing philosophical debates with each other about the nature of justice actually can sustain and inspire a life. Um, he, his, his contrasting example is the tragic way of life, the way of life presented in the tragedies, where people don't argue about they just do it. They, yeah, where they have these, these commitments that lead to massive failure, the, you know, tragic uh, failure. But the beauty of the attempt, he thought in the, in the Birth of Tragedy, um, could inform in the collective tragic festivals a kind of life affirmation. Um, and so I think the, the basic answer to your question is Nietzsche doesn't believe that the original Greek Enlightenment ideal of the discovery of the truth could lead to a kind of life affirmation, that it was actually enervating. It actually dissipated energy in skepticism and failure. This reminds me of the Phaedrus, where Socrates talks about how philosopher is really, in some sense, a derogatory term, because it means the love, the lover of wisdom. Yeah. So someone wants to call Socrates a wise man, and Socrates says, no, 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 I'm not a wise man. I'm merely a philosophia. I'm merely a, a lover of wisdom. And you're saying that in some sense, this is similar to Nietzsche's view, that you have to embrace the struggle. But the issue with the truth-seeking life, it seems like, is that people are too timid. You're not really risking anything when we're just sitting here debating truth and justice. But the tragic life, or, or the Homeric heroes, they're doers. They, they, even if they're motivated by lies, they're doers. Is that, is that a good way to understand um, that? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, uh, I, I'm reminded of this quote by Pascal that Nietzsche loved, uh, Se marquer de la philosophie, c'est philosophie. The, to mock philosophy is really to philosophize. You know, to, to, to be able to be, uh, it's really the version of Socratic ignorance. The one thing I know is that I, I don't know anything. It goes back to what you were saying about the difference between a third person point of view and a a first-person point of view. We, we, we don't know by knowing that we're nothing but biologically evolved animals what a biologically evolved animal should do. We still have to face the course of an alternate future and decide which path to take. We can't wait to see what our bodies are going to do, however evolutionarily evolved they are. If we think that we can figure out what a human life ought to look like by understanding the biomedical properties of human beings, something like that, or the brain, um, we're living under a kind of delusion that's actually, that's actually dangerous because we've sort of convinced ourselves self-deceptively um, that because we know that we're you know, complex carbon-based measuring devices, we should live that way. It doesn't follow. We have to decide to live that way. We have to find that a project that sustains a commitment because we find it valuable. Here's a corollary, um, a, another quote from your book. Thomas Carlyle, Compton, 
that economics finds the secret of this universe in supply and demand and reduces the duty of human governors to that of letting men alone. And so a dreary, desolate, and indeed quite abject and distressing science, what we might call by way of eminence, the dismal science. When such sciences are called dismal in this way, the point is not usually to claim that the results of such an investigation makes us gloomy or depressed. The point is broader, that such an assessment of human conduct and of value itself already reflects a somewhat low-minded orientation, even a skeptical reduction of non-economic value to market or exchange value. You've brought up this time multiple times already in your comment right before, in your critique of uh, the technologist today. Help us understand what exactly is at issue when we view the world through the lens of economics, of, of biomedicine, as, as you described. What's the issue here? Take the, the econo economistic model of rationality. Um, in the original utilitarian calculation, it was how to promote by efficient regulation of the market the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But people who had that commitment, like Mill, had some substantive conception of happiness. They had kind of an Aristotelian conception of happiness. But you can go a step lower than that and say, well, I have no idea what happiness is. I want a system of distribution and production that satisfies the greatest number of preferences that individuals have. And if you ask them, well, how are these preferences formed? Are they formed fairly, equitably, non-ideologically, in a non-distorted way? So the economists, I don't care. I have no idea. All I'm interested in is a system that allows for mutual, efficient preference satisfaction. And you know, Nietzsche, I think any, any philosopher would want to know, why, why should that be the highest aspiration we can have for a collective life? I think a, perhaps a good example of this is GDP, right? When politicians try to measure the health of their countries, they look at GDP because it's one easily quantifiable metric but for GDP, if I sell pornography versus mm -hmm. if I sell, I don't books on Nietzsche, mm -hmm. that's measures in the same unit. So it's really committing a form of violence between different forms of life and drawing this stark equality through quantification. That's the issue. Right. And the, uh, I think the, the larger issue is we can increase the amount of um, possible agreement if we lower the ambition. This is one of Nietzsche's great points about herd society where we're emerging into the era of the last men, um, by which he means we're, we're reducing human ambition and aspiration to such a low level, um, preference satisfaction, so it's a mutual preference satisfaction, um, that the idea that we can gain the greatest consensus by aspiring to the least ambitious goals is an extremely tempting one, because everyone wants to avoid conflict. We want, we want to make sure we live a kind of peaceable life. And we know through the history of the wars of religion and through all, all kinds of chaos in the early modern period, that with the collapse of the consensus of the Holy Roman Empire, the Catholic Church, the Reformation, and so forth, that the only real solution to this is war, um, promotes a kind of anxiety that leads to this diminishment of ambition and the resulting kind of moderation I mean, take, take, for example, the word elitism as a kind of negative, know, right. negative word that we, in which we, we don't want to aspire to be better than we are because then somebody has to be in the position of being where we left them behind. Right. So um, uh, Nietzsche thinks we've gotten ourselves into a kind of dilemma in what we're willing to do. And the dilemma leads to this kind of Girardian conformism you've been talking about. Right. Here's another issue that truth presents to us. And I'm going to quote you here. We moderns do not have a culture. Our culture is not a living thing. It is just the ingestion without digestion of our own past. We are walking encyclopedias, not participants in a cultural enterprise. The whole of modern culture looks like a book titled Handbook of Subjective Culture for Outward Barbarians. Barbarians yeah. The issue isn't that we're not cultured enough. It's that we know, we don't embody, but we know too much about other cultures. The example I was gonna give is I'm desperately trying to be religious for reasons that I won't go into. I'm very interested in the afterlife and what happens to us. Um, the issue I have is that most people aren't religious now because they don't think any religions are, are coherent. I think too many of them are coherent. Mm -hmm. So I grew up as, a, as yeah. a Protestant. From the first person perspective, I obviously studied some theology like Augustine, Aquinas, Gerard, of course. The issue is I had the same experience with Buddhism. 
-hmm. I also practiced Buddhism for about two or three years, and I studied with, it, with its great theologians. And it has set up a problem of uh, what the ancient skeptics called equipolis, right? That there are two competing and incommensurable theories or, or frameworks um, and there's no way for me to choose between those. Mm -hmm. So my problem of religion is very different from the, from the regular moderns, a problem of not being able to believe, right? Where they don't find anything convincing. I almost find too much coherent, but the issue is that they're incompatible. So is that another way where too much truth can be an issue? Where even if it is the first person view, the embodied view, if there's too much conflicting types of cultures, when we look back and we see there's so many different ways of arranging society, we have much less certainty that our way of doing things is the right one. Is that an issue? Well, it's interesting you put it that way because um, you know you're you're almost approaching the problem as, as if it's a skeptical problem of equipoise, as if you know one should emerge superior, um, and as if there's a kind of foundational question that could be answered better by one approach. Why be a Buddhist rather than a Christian? As if there's a kind of answer to that question. But wouldn't you say that most people, um, when they express a belief, they believe something they take to be true, but they don't believe it because they've been convinced in a way that has led them away from another point of view, like another, another religion. What they do is cite their experience. They say, and you know, in the, in the Christian tradition, it's the experience of grace, that there has to become, there has to be a moment where you've experienced something so powerful. You can't really offer it as a reason to somebody to join their faith or to, 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 to switch allegiances. But you know, if, putting it in terms of equal poets is already, in a way, right. to frame it. Rational, the, yeah, from it, a third it, person it, perspective, yeah, right. What you need to right. be religious is the experience they right. have. And if you don't have it, you can't find right. it by looking for it. So that's a, that's a great pushback. And this is why I wanted to preface this by saying, um, in addition to engaging both theology, I was a practitioner of both. Mm -hmm. So I did have the experience of both. And it's an interpretive issue. This grace that I've been receiving, is that grace or is it karma? And I have experienced both of those experiences yeah. internally from those perspectives. And of course, the explanation is very different. So it's a, it's a competition of experience as well as a competition of, of, of rationality. Of, I, does I, that make sense? Well, the people I know and respect who are religious um, speak of a kind of overwhelming experience that just can't be denied. It's right. not something they think they can take up. Right, they can interpret one test. way or the next. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, they think they've just been. They've just. They've just fundamentally had something enter their life that they can't deny, um, and they can't give it to you. They can't. You can't practice it. So, I mean, going back to the Pascalian response to "I can't pray," which is just do it. Work every the machine, day. right? Yeah. Do it every day, and you'll eventually pray. Well, that's that's not an inspirational kind of project. That's a deadening kind of project, the same sort of thing with trying out various, I mean, I understand your motivation for doing it. It's just not something you can do. You can't try out a religion. Right. You, you've, you've got to be overwhelmed by something that exceeds the bounds of rational explicability. I've never had that experience. I don't, I think there are limits to rational explicability. But my sources of meaning come from things like literature and poetry and film. They don't, and, and it used to come from philosophy. I used, I used, to, I used to think, there was a source of meaning in reading philosophical texts. And actually, this is a really good example of what you were asking about in the first part, the, the sort of the actual meaning of nihilism. Um, it, because you can't create by looking for it sources of meaning. It has to be reflected back to you in the world you live in. It has to be a worldly thing. I sympathize with your problem, but um, searching for it by trying things out is I, th I think something Nietzsche would find um, just impossible given the right. nature of the phenomenon. Right. I, I want to make one last perhaps Nietzschean defense of my position, which is um, Nietzsche often says that people who uh, single-mindedly buy into one, one type of philosophy or religion just shows that they haven't been exposed to enough. And I, growing up in, in the East and then moving to the West, perhaps has been exposed to too much. Let's say I was a Christian in medieval Europe. Mm -hmm. I think I could much easily make the Kierkegaardian leap of faith. Or if I was a, 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 a citizen of Hang Dynasty China, I could much easier uh, leap, make the leap of faith to Buddhism. And so that brings back to my question about truth in our discussion of what is creating nihilism. Is there 
is even too much first person truth, is that even threatening to, to being able to hold commitments? Because you see the amount of uh, uh, yeah. sort of substitutes out there. The way you, you phrase it is, I think, uh, quite right. One, one can't be a Greek aristocrat. One can't be a medieval monk. Um, one, one, one can't be a samurai. You think of all these great Chris Hour films, which are precisely about this. Uh, uh, what happens when the way of life of the samurai dies out? Otherwise, you're Don Quixote. You're, you're yeah, a laughing stock, yeah, right? right? Right. And in many of these Kurosawa films, the way of the samurai looks so anachronistic and potentially corrupt, and that the whole culture of honor uh, no longer makes any sense. To I mean, that's that's kind of an example, I think, of why Nietzsche's project has to be looked at within the context of his interpretation of modernity. He thought he could be a new kind of Socrates in the way in which after the, the collapse of the tragic form of life, in which the coherence of Greek culture as expressed in tragic affirmation was clearly no longer possible in Euthyphro, um, Socrates offered an alternative and it caught on. It grabbed people and the Western rationalist tradition became a kind of dominant. So uh, it, it doesn't seem to me that we can answer these questions so much in terms of like responding to the undergraduate answer but what does Nietzsche want us to do? It's not what he wants us, uh, you know, any individual to do. It's this aspiration. What the world needs to be, right? It's aspiration he had that his life, the form of his writing, the rhetoric of his writing, could both shame us about our lack of self-knowledge and dishonesty and inspire us to a form of courage and honesty that he could only give us a kind of picture of in terms of his own dissatisfaction and his own aspiration. But that failed. It turned out that the most powerful prophetic voice in the late modern tradition was Marx, not Nietzsche, right. who inspired the best minds, the best intellects, um, all the way through the horrors of the Stalin collapse of this kind of, of confidence. Uh, but in the 60s, Nietzsche came back you know, and began to dominate the imagination of Western European intellectuals again, Heidegger being the most prominent. Right. So let's move to another big cause of, of nihilism, and that's a deficiency of, of self-contempt. So let me, let me quote to you your book. The most important of the psychological issues Nietzsche must deal with is what he called this tension in the bow, the way a soul can be said to pull against itself. A tension, I suggested, was the way Nietzsche understood the phenomenon of self-consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. The metaphor of the bow is that there's a bow body, and that might be the positive ideal, but there must be a bow string, and that's the self-content. And the wider that you can pull these two things, the more tension, the more erotic force there will be in a life. Yeah. Is that why self-content is necessary to achieve this type of, these type of commitments? Not, not sort of universally as a fact about human nature, but now. He's trying to say what our enterprise in the modern world is, is to release that tension, not to live with that tension. And the tension is something like self-contempt, as you're intimating. That is a dissatisfaction with the low level of our aspirations, with the low level of the aspirations of a, of a liberal democratic consumerist global capitalist culture. He wouldn't put it in those terms. He'd talk about herd animals and his terms would be more Girardian than, than economistic. But, um, it, it does have to do with um, being able to generate enough dissatisfaction to generate the tension in the bow. And I think part of his rhetoric is meant to do that. He, it's meant to make us ashamed. So what you're saying is that the self-contempt needs to be historically contingent to our current sort of value system. Right. I read you a bit differently. I read you as saying action itself is negation. And so yeah, even yeah, if we yeah. live oh, yeah, in yeah. the Homeric world, for us to really strive to, to become someone mm -hmm. that's radically different means shedding a part of ourselves, that's right. which means a self-content. So it seems like there needs to be this contingent self-content for our current values, but even in the right value system, self-content is, is necessary. Is well, that right? Let, let's distinguish between experiencing a kind of erotic lack and self-contempt. That notion of an erotic lack is one manifestation of what makes human life capable of a kind of energetic directedness that Nietzsche's psychological approach is interested in. To use your own example again, uh, taking a risk on another kind of project uh, 
that you don't really have any models for. I mean, how many people are doing what 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 you're doing? I mean, it could turn out you'll finish after three or four years, and you know your, your YouTube numbers go down to fifteen right, a, crickets a, a month. It's a very valuable thing I think you're doing, but if it's not sustained in the world, if nobody cares, if the world isn't interested in it, if this seems to them bookish and nerdy and um, you know elitist and unpolitical and ignorant of the suffering in the world. Out if, of touch, right. Yeah, if all of that happens, then it turns out you have to reassess what it meant for you to, to do this. I mean, I think it's great, but uh, you know, it, 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 it is true that this aspiration you have has to have some resonance in the world. You have to find partners. You have to find a culture that accepts it. You, you, otherwise, how do you know you're not insane? Nietzsche's own life is one example. It's, it's a sad example in a way uh, because he couldn't find any resonance. He was in a way trying to do what you're, you're doing. He, you know, he wandered around the Adriatic coast going from pension to pension. Um, whenever the rates changed, so he could afford it, carrying one crate full of a bunch of books and papers. And talking to intellectuals. <laughs> looking, looking for people to talk to, writing letters, self-publishing his books, 100, 200 copies. If he was lucky, sold most of them in return. Um, think, of the, think of the courage and the riskiness of that life, something he was quite, quite conscious of. His major image, the one I love the most, is what we need to do is set out on a boat on a new sea without knowing where we're going. We just know we don't want to be where we are. So we get in the boat, we just start sailing, and we, we see what we find. The possibility of failure seems to be a necessary compo component yeah. in both the example of the boat you give as well as my, yeah. uh, my own project yeah. for it to count as genuine striving. Why is the possibility of failure necessary? Well, because we, we don't live with the usual kind of guidelines, um, you know, the North Star or the, we, we don't have the kind of, given a, a collapse in the belief that we can determine uh, a, a sort of eternal objective basis for how human beings ought to live, everything we try is an experiment, and experiments fail as well as succeed. It just comes with the territory. Take, uh, take social media. You remember the, the, the early arguments for the greatness of social media was that it would democratize knowledge. It would, it would uh, produce this kind of well-informed, uh, lively Citizen. public sphere. And what it's done is destroy political will formation and, in fact, destroy the public sphere by creating these little silos of often insanity that don't get integrated or challenged by any other point of view. So um, we thought that would work. It didn't. It's a catastrophe, the, the influence of social media on especially the young. Right. It just didn't work. It's destroyed the possibility of a public discourse about a common good. So we gotta we gotta try something else. Right. So I'm gonna try to summarize here. This is the second part when we talked about the cause of nihilism. One thing clearly has to do with the surplus of the wrong type of truth. And um, that's the third person type of truth. That's the economic view perhaps of things. Um, another issue seems to be the wrong type of first person truth. And that's mm -hmm. sort of self-deceit. And Nietzsche, if I understand you correctly, wants us to feel a specific self-content at our current situation. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want us to feel okay to live in these bourgeois ideals. He wants to motivate the, in his own words, higher men to create new value systems that can uh, inspire us to enter this, this new age. So let's move on to the third part of our conversation and talk about what Nietzsche's proposed solution is. And reading your book, I understand that the ideal of self-overcoming is going to be a central part of Nietzsche's solution. Can you give us an, an elaboration? I, I think the way to orient ourselves um, uh, is not, again, by a kind of discursive formulation of what we need now, but by an immersion in um, what are the greatest imaginative poets, novelists, filmmakers, musicians even, have shown us about ways of living that have a kind of integrity and depth to them, even in the absence of this sort of fixed hierarchy of values. I think of things like uh, Henry James's novels about, uh, about extremely intelligent, astute characters 
who no longer have the rigid European hierarchy of values to rely on and who regard the American experiment in democratization and equality as a disguised version of conformism and capitalist consumerism and so forth. The Ambassadors is a good example there. You get these beautiful portraits of you know, people who are trying to figure out how to live with their wits, with their interpretive sensibilities. The ship that's sailing without knowing where we're going. Well, you need to be a really good sailor. And that means to have a kind of finesse trained by exposure to examples that show you what people are trying to do who have a kind of admirable integrity and honesty about themselves when they do it. Proust is another example. Another way of framing what you're saying is this isn't the first time, even in just the West, that this has happened. There are times where there was great shock and change and great uncertainty, and someone was able to establish a new model. Um, and the solution that you're keeping pushing me to is aesthetic imitation, right? To, to observe these great models who did live in historical circumstances similar to our own and who was able to uh, create a new system of values. I'm gonna to try to ask you one more discursive question, if that's okay, which is these new value systems that we create, do we have to believe that they are transitory or can, should we aspire to create something eternal? Let me quote to you your book. We live in the first epoch in which we must admit that we do not know in the traditional objectivist or religious sense what is worth wanting or aspiring to, where the danger of nihilism is always threatening. The prospect of a constantly self-overcoming structure of valuation is what obviously provokes this danger. And Nietzsche's aspiration is that such an age might also allow human beings who are prepared to be constantly over or beyond themselves, ubermensch, they might be called. I thought what you were trying to say was that what's unique about modernity is that we have to give up mm -hmm. this idea of establishing uh, an eternal system and be okay with one system overcoming uh, the next. Yeah, I think that's quite right. I, I, I don't know that we have to be committed to transitoriness, but we have to expect it. We have to, um, I mean, I'm an old man now, so I've lived through uh, assassinations, the Vietnam War, you know, Watergate, uh, uh, 2001, 2008, you know, Trump, everything I used to rely on that I could count on in being a professor is no longer reliable. It's no, it's no longer the case that you can be a philosophy professor the way you were 40 years ago or 50 years ago when I started. Um, so uh, it's not as if um, we have any choice about transitoriness. This, the situation of modernity, I mean, his famous quote from Marx, all that solid melts in the air and it gets rebuilt. Um, suppose you were to ask someone, what's the most significant and salient manifestation of the implications of this, this collapse? I would say we don't want to acknowledge it. But we, we don't want to acknowledge it not in a, in a kind of honest way because we think we have a, a, a strong, resolute response to the possibility that it may have happened. Our response, again, I want to come back to this, this phenomenon of collective self-deceit. Um, we, we have narcoticized ourselves into thinking it hasn't happened. So Everything is okay. Everything is fine. We've, we've made a great deal of progress. Um, things, we've got problems and so forth. But the basic, uh, the basic problems of human existence have been solved by a kind of rational bureaucracy, a market economy, liberal democratic institutions, privatization of religion, and so forth. I, I saw a TV interview where some guy was interviewing somebody who had written a book on Heidegger and collapse of meaningfulness. And the guy said, quite honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. I have a good job. I, I love my family. I love my wife. Uh, I, you know, I, 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 the job I have is interesting. I meet interesting people. I, I mean, what are you talking about? Is this failure of meaning, collapse, or anything? Well, if you've succeeded in convincing yourself of something like that, how do you break through that? What Nietzsche is trying to do is shake us up. Uh, that's the first getting us on the track for this more dissatisfied, exploratory, 
sailing to new seas without knowing where we're going, risk taking, gambling. That's step number courage, one. Honesty. The first thing we have to do is awaken everybody right. to something that's failed. The primary issue is not to think of self knowledge as a matter of introspection, as self observation. It, it, it's a more a, a matter of coming, coming to experience what we've done to ourselves. I mean, one example would be psychoanalysis. You, if, a somebody, if somebody goes into psychoanalysis and says, um, you know, I don't know, some, I, I, I keep dating the same kind of woman, and um, it's a type of woman I know is going to be a disaster for me, um, but I keep doing it. Why do I keep doing it? And the psychoanalyst says, well, because you hate your father and you want to sleep with your mother, it doesn't do anything for you. The, the, the therapeutic response has to be to get you to actually live through, through in psychoanalysis, through transference, but in, in a more general sense, to kind of live out in an experiential way what you've done to yourself. There has to be a transformational moment in um, coming to terms with what we've hidden from ourselves. Right. And this is a great segue for us to talk about Nietzsche's form. Mm. Nietzsche does not write yeah. in an analytical manner that you're going to see yeah, in philosophy right. today. Yeah. He's trying to have us enter a gestalt switch, right? Something a, like a, that. An interpretive, this interpretive transformative switch. moment that reading the books will accomplish. Right. And why is literature or the literary form rather than the philosophical form the way to do that? Well, I mean, take the difference between reading Descartes' Meditations and reading Goethe's Faust. I mean, I don't think that there are many people whose lives have been transformed by Descartes' meditations or Leibniz's monodology. Or, or transformed in the, in the positive direction. Well, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or Locke's Second Treatise or Hobbes' Leviathan. John Rawls wrote a book called Theory of Justice in 1970. That was a very, very smart, sophisticated book. Rawls thought, though, that he was doing a kind of foundational work in lending credibility to post-war welfareism in liberal democratic cultures and the book would have this transformative effect on public policy. It didn't. It was, a, it was a philosophy book and it interested mostly philosophers and political theorists in political, in political science departments. Um, so it, you, know, you, you have to ask yourself, and I used to ask freshmen this teaching in the core, um, I want you to all write down what book you read that actually changed something in, in your life. I, I never got a philosophy book. I mean, mostly people didn't know what to say. So they often just said the Bible. I mean, they didn't mean it, but they knew they had to say something, so they said, so they said that. And some of them had very, you know, kind of disappointing answers, like Slaughterhouse-Five or the, the young, young person's novel that's uh, by Salinger right. or something like, something like that. Right. Um, but I don't, uh, I, I don't think there's anything all that inspirational about it. Philosophy pretends to be a mode of knowledge of a particular kind of truth. I mean, right now, philosophy is limited to what they think of as conceptual analysis. What we can do in philosophy that's valuable is make our concepts clearer. Well, if you ask somebody why they are willing to die for a government, it's not because they've been convinced of a political argument offered by Locke or Hobbes or Rousseau or Rawls. So, why are we providing those arguments to people? Right. Well, because we need these ideals that we can aspire to. But if the ideals don't have any connection, goes back to the doing philosophy from the perspective of life. If the ideals don't have any connection with what it would mean to incorporate it into a life in a way that would actually inspire doing it, what's the point? What's the point? Right. I mean, you, you, you could ask yourself, what is, what is Shakespeare's philosophy? You, you, wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to say it. It's so multidimensional and sensitive to and appreciative of um, the variety of human nature that there's nothing you can summarize about it, but he's one of the great geniuses. And there's nothing more affirmatively um, inspirational than the fact that there could have been somebody like, like Shakespeare. Shakespeare. This negative view, this view of the, the impotence of philosophy, let's put it that way, is it something new that you developed? Because lifelong, you've been a philosophy professor, right? Yeah. You've, you've, you, you, you've written philosophy books yeah. on, on Hegel. Yeah. Yeah, well, Hegel took seriously his job as a university professor at a public university. So did Fichte, so did, so did Kant to a certain extent. Um, that they could, uh, in their lectures, show people how reason was actually embodied in a life. Hegel, Hegel said in the preface of the philosophy of right, the last thing philosophy should try to do is 
give people ideals of how they ought to live. They should help them understand how they are living. Right. And so Hegel was the philosopher I was most interested in because of that aspiration. Mm. Because he didn't think that... It's a weaker view of the power of reason. Philosophy's right. job is, is its own time comprehended in thought. We have to understand what's happening to us. There have been moments in philosophy when it really did aspire to have a kind of publicly influential role. Hegel, Wittgenstein, the early Russell, um, the, the Bloomsbury group, all of that um, is a kind of model for what philosophy, but I don't think there is anything left of that. Right, right, yeah. Um, one of the funniest uh, times I had when reading Hegel was when I read that he said he wants to make his writing comprehensible to the public. Right. And I'm like, okay, so this is him yeah. reading, this is him writing in a comprehensible way. I can't yeah. wait to, to, to see his incomprehensible writing. Um, this is going to be reductive, but is it fair to summarize the role of literature and philosophy as philosophy is about the diagnosis, the justification, the, the, the making the currents transparent, whereas literature, that is what is going to take us to the future. That is what encourages striving. Is I that right? I wouldn't go that far. That, that's in a way still too, too programmatic. You know, there, there are things you can't get by looking to achieve them. Right. Like you can't try to, going back, you can't try to be religious. You can't try to be, it, 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 it's one of those enterprises that you have to hope there's some kind of moment of inspiration. It happens to you happens to you in a certain way. Yeah. So I have some hope that in the modern sensibility, the ability of sophisticated film um, to uh, serve this role of a kind of vehicle of self-knowledge, of illumination, of overcoming self-deceit. There are moments of uh, cinematic inspiration that I think can also be kind of revelatory. I think that's actually more a model of Nietzsche than the kind of here's what we've done wrong, here I'm going to correct it with these truths that I've now unearthed about human motivation, the animalistic nature of human instincts, and so forth. There's one last topic I want to explore in terms of the, the prescriptions. I know you don't want to be that programmatic when you talk about Nietzsche, um, that Nietzsche provides us, and that's the positive ideal of Montaigne. So talk to us about Montaigne and, and why he was such a positive role model for Nietzsche. Montaigne had no illusions about the corruption of human nature, about the fragility of the human aspiration to anything worthwhile, how fragile that way, no illusions whatsoever. I mean, he lived in a rich life. He was an administrator, a soldier, a writer. Um, uh, he really had a wide experience of life. And he wrote with a kind of um, wisdom, to use an old fashioned word, that wasn't based on any kind of theoretical enlightenment. Um, it was much more, to go back to this issue of what it would be to write philosophy from the perspective of life, of trying to figure out what it is to live a life from the, what you've been calling the first person, quite rightly, the first person point of view. Montaigne gives you, him, as he says, I'm just giving you myself as a model, what it's like to live out a life that I've experienced. I don't claim anything for anybody else. Um, but clearly that's, that's a kind of guarded comment. He is presenting a kind of ideal balance in life between skepticism and a certain kind of cheerfulness. He found in things like friendship um, a consolation for what he also found to be corrupt and weak, weak-willed, self-deceived about, about human life. Um, so I think Nietzsche really admired what he kept calling heiterkeit, cheerfulness. Um, it's one of, one of the most um, affirmative kind of human virtues that Nietzsche kept appealing to, along with Redlichkeit, honesty, um, and mood, courage. These are kind of the virtues he thinks the modern world can inspire in us as a way of transcending its pathologies. And Montaigne turns out to be a perfect example of a kind of cheerfulness that's not naive, but it, it isn't based on a kind of optimistic theoretical view about history or human progress, or it's just a way of exhibiting an attitude towards life um, that Montaigne claims no general universal value of, but can provide one if one is inspired in the right way by it. So what I take uh, the delicate balancing act of Montaigne to be is on the one hand, being skeptical of human nature, um, seeing humans for sometimes the cruel creatures that they are, but on the other hand, being able to maintain a cheerfulness despite of that. 
And I think that the, the two extremes that one can fall into on one, on one side, it's the sort of California mob, right? It's the, you're so awesome, you're amazing, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. On the other side, it's the, I think, like internet troll doomer. It's like, nothing's gonna work out. I think it's intuitively why the lack of cheerfulness in this doomer type perspective is bad. What's wrong with the California mob? What, what's wrong with being a bit naive if that means that you get that cheerfulness? Well, I mean, I go back to Nietzsche's phrase, wretched contentment. Um, uh, the, other, the other image he has are cows chewing their cud, contentedly chewing their cud. Would you want to be a cow if you could be happy? <laughs> I don't know that you can give somebody an answer to that. Um, it, it, you know, there's a high price to pay. Your life narrows down to a level of satisfaction that, again, is possible because so reduced. Uh, if you aspire nothing more than to a beautiful house with a view of the ocean, you know, a very nice car, and yeah, you can be you can be kind of happy, but you're living the life of uh, you know, uh, what, what Nietzsche would call a herd animal. Your life is not your own. You know, you 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 immerse yourself in a kind of life that is nothing but a concatenation of ideals conceived from social media, television, movies, magazines. You don't have a sense that you're directing your life, as, but you're, you're so ignorant of that, you're living in a kind of dream. Maybe another way to, to reframe your answer is that the cheerfulness of the California mom is not the noble cheerfulness oh, yeah, of sure. Montaigne, right? It's a, it's a sure. low-minded cheerfulness. That's the issue. Sure. That's the issue at heart. So let's go to the last part of our interview today, and this is the part that I'm most looking forward to. In your book, you claim that Nietzsche has failed. Why do you say that? First of all, he didn't succeed in, uh, and he, I think he knew he didn't. You could tell by the, uh, the anxiety and hysteria of his claims that he did hmm. serve as a pivotal moment in Western history. Someday there will be chairs in universities devoted to the study of Zarathustra. He's right, but the issue is that he had to insist it. That's what the giveaway. Yeah, right, right. You, you protest too much or brags too much. He didn't become a new Socrates. Um, nobody listened to him. After he went insane in um, uh, 1890, he did become very famous, but he became famous in this extraordinarily unpredictable way for left-wing feminists, for vegetarians, for right-wing aristocrats, for Catholic conservatives, for he just became everybody who had contempt for the low-mindedness and conformism of the modern world seized on Nietzsche as a, as a hero, especially European intellectuals uh, in the period leading up to and then after the First World, world War. But Nietzsche didn't know any of that because he was catatonic by the time his uh, books began to sell like crazy in the decade that he was insane and under the control of his evil sister. Um, so, uh, but I think going back to what you were talking about with Montaigne, he realized that he never, he never achieved the kind of equilibrium in his life. He did say um, the one thing he feels about his life is dankbarkeit, gratitude. It's like the, uh, the eternal return of the same kind of thought experiment. I mean, would you, would you want to live your life over and over and over and over and over again? And he, he basically said yes, uh, because of the satisfactions of honesty. I mean, if you suspect self-deceit in yourself, it's very hard to respect yourself. If you, if you constantly feel that you're running away from something or you're escaping from something, um, you don't really have the kind of self-dignity that you want. You begin to become ashamed, you know? And Nietzsche is sort of the opposite of that, the ruthlessness with which he analyzed himself and the culture that he lived in is something that gave him an enormous amount of uh, pride. So it sounds like the failure of Nietzsche is on two fronts. One is on the cultural front. He did not create a new Socrates. We're still in the modernity that he detested. But he also had a personal failure. And maybe to use the three virtues that you said he had honesty, he had courage, he didn't have cheerfulness. Yeah. Obviously, the question is why. Yeah. Why did Nietzsche fail in such a spectacular manner? Well, you know, as I say in the book, you know, I think his answer would have been, you, you take Montaigne out of the 16th century and you put him in the late 19th century and have him look around at what had happened 
to um, advanced Western culture in the late 19th century. I doubt he'd be cheerful either. I mean, in other words, um, the, the kind of settledness of the world, the aristocratic world, prefect revolutionary world, uh, and in a way, a world where the religious wars of the Reformation were only getting started. Um, um, and you put him in a world as riven by religious dissension, by um, political dissension, by um, a collapse of the kind of sense of a common pursuit of a common good. Um, I, I, I think Nietzsche would have said Montaigne could not have predicted um, what this new situation would reveal about human beings. And about You'd be capacity. even more skeptical about human nature, much and more less, skeptical. less cheerful. Much right, more that's skeptical. the trade-off. Right. Although, if you think of the things that consoled Montaigne, primarily friendship, I wonder. I mean, you know, Montaigne had a very strong personality. Right. So obviously, that's a very charitable reading of Nietzsche's failure. In your book, you seem to give a less charitable fa uh, reading of Nietzsche's failure. There's something specifically wrong with his ideas. I quote to your book: "I must be able to see myself in the deed." but also such that what I understand is being attempted and realized is also what others understand. Right. I haven't performed the action, haven't volunteered for the mission, if nothing I do is so understood by others as that act. This social dimension is often ignored in Nietzsche's interpretations in favor of some heroic individualism. The concern is a Hegelian point. Right. If you don't receive recognition that you are in fact the type of person that you think you are, you're gonna go crazy. Yeah. Which is what happens to Nietzsche. And it's a, it's a good point, since you are such a Girard fan, fan, of making this distinction between conformist mimetic desire and the desire for recognition. Uh, the desire for recognition is not a desire to be thought well of for the sake of being thought well of as elevation, as being thought well of, especially as better than anyone else. It's the desire to have one's sense of one's own life as one wants to lead it, reflected in others. One doesn't need it just for a kind of confirmation. Um, one needs it to avoid a kind of loneliness and isolation and potential insanity. If I take myself to be on a certain kind of enterprise that everybody else recognizes as uh, worthless or without value, if I can't be sustained, what else have I got? I mean, I don't have the consolation of having a kind of rational insight into the truth anymore. Uh, we rely on each other for balance, for I mean, recognition, the struggle for recognition also means not just to be affirmatively affirmed by others, uh, but also to be engaged with in a way that is actually potentially co a, a contestatory, that, that somebody says corrects to balance our self-understanding by the understanding others have of us in the right way without being either conformist or heroic. That's a Hegelian ideal of recognition, of cognitive equality. Um, and very, very different from conformism, of just doing whatever will be necessary to get myself recognized. That's not worth anything. It's like paying somebody to recognize you. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything for you. You want there to be a form of life in which the openness of our exchanges, you know, resemble something like a philosophical conversation, not, not saying anything to please the other, but not saying anything just to defeat the other. Um, the ideal of a philosophical conversation of, as being mutually illuminating in a way that can be self-correcting as well as self-affirming is, I think, what Nietzsche missed. He, he thought of any kind of compromise with sociality, with my dependence on others, was Girardian, was mimetic in that sense. It's interesting because Girard is famous for his um, critique, one could say, of mimetic desire, right? Mimetic desire is to uh, desire the things, to have the things that the superior model has. But Girard has a often overlooks a species of mimesis that he calls negative mimesis. Mm -hmm. And that's the exact opposite logic. It's to be distant from the things where you consider the person with a low amount of status and being is. So that's it, also a kind of dependence. Exactly. There's a movie, I think, called The Wild Ones in the 50s, where Marlon Brando is playing this, yeah. uh, this character of, cycle. of yeah, yeah. Re exactly rebellion yeah. of uh, you know, really cool, being in a biker jacket, beautiful women around him. And he's asked, what are you rebelling against? Mm -hmm. And he says, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so he's going to rebel against anything you give him, much like the conformist is going to agree with any, everything you give him. True. Is that a way to understand Nietzsche's Well, issue? I mean, to, to, to make a point for Nietzsche, Nietzsche didn't find any intellectual partners. Um, uh, it, it wasn't that he was you know, just trying to distance himself for the sake of distancing himself. 
um, the, the, the world he lived in had very few resources for the kind of radical beginning he was trying to initiate. Um, the self-contentment and self-deceit he encountered were very, very hard for him to over. He did everything he could to overcome it. He just couldn't. I mean, the, the world was just too rock solid resistant to it. So let's say someone were to agree with us that this lacking social dimension, this lacking Hegelian dimension is the issue, a, a big issue in Nietzsche's thought. Is there an easy way to amend that given the individualistic character of his thought? Is it for perhaps we can amend the metaphor of going to sea, of uh, a sailing? Is it easy as to amend the metaphor and say, you need to go with friends? So I, was, I was a sophomore in 68. It was a moment of like the French Revolution or after the First World War. So I mean, it just seemed like everything was falling apart. There was a great aspirational hope that the answer to your question was yes, that, that there could be a return to local democracy. People could control the decisions that affected their own lives. And there was this massive failure. I mean, it produced Nixon. It was just like 1929 didn't produce what the Marxists hoped for. The, inter the widespread international collapse of capitalism occurred. But instead of a worker's uh, paradise, we got fascism in Italy, Spain, Germany, and Japan. Um, so that, that led to um, a kind of withdrawal from an aspiration for the public world of many, many people of my generation. Now, you know, many of them became social workers and local, local bureaucrats, and they, they tried to work hard to improve whatever conditions they could improve. Same kind of thing with environmentalists now, where the situation is so globally hopeless, but there are still people who are recycling and doing whatever they can and being committed. But there are many of us who just withdrew into things like academic life, philosophy, book writing. Um, and I think um, we're at a moment where the kind of aspirations that were failed in 68, uh, no longer even exist. I, I, don't, I don't think there is any aspirational hope, and I don't think there should be for any widespread transformation in the power of what I now regard as you know, the, the more correct category than conformism and nihilism, global capitalism, the manipulation of human life by the power of capital. I don't, I don't have any hope for a Marxist revolution either. Uh, I, I think we're basically screwed. Despite it being screwed, are you still cheerful? Have you managed to sort of well, race apocalypse yeah, with mean, a sort of it, cheerfulness? Yeah, it, it has to do with this kind of personally transformative ethos that you wanted to create for yourself. That you would, I mean, it's, it's like Voltaire encouraging became us became a local project yeah, is what you're yeah, saying. Mm -hmm, but yeah. I thought you corrected me in the beginning when you said that it, it can't be a local project. Well, this form of striving. if you live in a university, you get enough of a social world that reaffirms what you're trying to do. You get it from your students. Local meaning not personal, but there's a small communitarian. There's, there's right. enough recognitive community of like-mindedness to be reassuring enough to be sustaining. You know, in the you know, if I if I here at the University of Chicago, especially if I announce a course on Hegel's phenomenology, I won't get as I would at Stanford or Princeton nine, ten students. I get 120. There's still a kind of intellectual excitement here about. I mean, sure, Columbia is the same way. There's still a, a kind of ethos of what's important that I find important. But it's certainly not shared nationally. It's not part of the culture anymore. You get the, it's almost, McIntyre made this point in the 70s. It's like a, a return to a monastic culture. Our, our main task now is preservationist. I mean, essentially what you're doing is preservationist. You're, you're keeping alive the capacity to read these difficult texts with patience, finesse, and love. Um, that's our task right now. I mean, there's, maybe there's a 200, 400 year dark age coming. But uh, if, if we can keep alive um, some residue of humanity in, in books and in the way we read books, great classics of the past, great monuments to the human intellect and imagination, we'll be all right. So it sounds like you very much agree with Nietzsche's diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But your personal response to this is not as heroic as what Nietzsche probably would have hoped. Yeah. It's a much more reserved preservation, like you said, almost waiting for, for, for something else to happen, right? Like waiting for a vanguard to form or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the key question is this, this Hegelian question. Where are the traces of, of reason or inspiration in contemporary society? I, I, I find it in some areas of philosophy, in film, in some areas of modern poetry. Uh, I, I think there's reason to be relatively optimistic that Something about the human spirit you know, will, will right. not be crushed, will not be extinguished. I see. So it's, it's, 
a diagnosis of our current historical contingent situation that you think there, there is no hope, but it doesn't mean that the human spirit itself is hopeless. No, no, Hence why you need to preserve it. No revolutionary trend. That's what I, I think uh, Zarathustra came to understand uh, and what one of the meanings of the eternal return is saying. There's no revolutionary moment in which everything afterwards is going to be different than everything before, which is the, actually the Christian view of the incarnation. The history is divided between what happened before the incarnation, what happened afterward. The French Revolution has the same sense of itself. Um, but I, I don't think, and I think it's Zarathustra, that's part of the, the issue of Zarathustra. He had to give up that view. The eternal return of the same means not just the return of what is valuable and preserved, but also its failure, its dissolution again into uh, corruption, consumerism, conformism, and so forth. Right. I want to explore one more way that Nietzsche potentially failed. And this mode of failure doesn't come directly from his theory, like the Hegelian, Hegelian failure does, but it comes from his life. Mm. So I quote to you your book. The surprising Nietzschean turn of that screw would be that the true realization of the will to power has nothing to do with gaining and holding power as traditionally understood, except as an indifference to power in this traditional sense. I take this as a critique, to put it bluntly, that Nietzsche has been a loser for most of his life. Maybe not in his early life when he was made professor, but that he was so ignored by society and that's where his resentment was channeled and that's where his lack of power made him focus way too much on power. Maybe this ties into what you were saying about Nietzsche's odd celebrity, that he gathered a lot of people who were, um, who looked down upon modern age. When I meet Nietzsche Nietzscheans today, it's rarely the blonde beast, right? It's rarely the hyper successful type. It's usually someone who's like Nietzsche, who's resentful, who's somewhat sickly, who's really been marginalized from society. Yeah, that's a good point. On the contrapositive, when I do meet the blonde beast today of society, insofar as th there are any left, they're quite content. They don't think about power every day, right? They have that sort of aristocratic indifference. That's a good point to make, but I don't think, I don't think it's totally fair to Nietzsche. I don't think he's a creature of resentiment. I, I think he does have, in just writing the books he wrote, uh, some sort of aspiration to be transformative in a way that isn't just reactive, but is life affirming rather than no saying. Um, I mean, you could, you could, we could both quote passages that confirm one, one side of Nietzsche rather than the other, but he did have another side. And it's, it's the other side that's more like uh, the realism of Thucydides rather than the resentment of someone like, uh, oh, I don't know, Hobbes or Demetre or any of the concerts, Carl Schmidt or something like that. Um, more, more like the intuitive insight of Sophocles or Montaigne than, than the skepticism of, uh, of, of someone like Schopenhauer. I think he overcame that kind of skepticism and life-denying impulse. And I think his heroes like Goethe or Montaigne or Shakespeare. That's what keeps Nietzsche going. So I, I think you're right that there are elements of Nietzsche that are um, what he would regard as having fallen onto the dark side. Um, but there are many, many other elements that indicate he kept his balance, right. not perhaps as well as Montaigne, but not as uh, unbalanced as someone like Schopenhauer. I see. So maybe to conclude our interview, for our audience back home who agrees with a lot of the diagnoses that uh, you read into, into Nietzsche about the problems of the, the day and who might not just be con content in this preservationist project that you said you and I are, are both partaking. Any word of advice, last word of wisdom? No, I don't think philosophy uh, is in any position to give advice. I mean, you, you can't give someone something. What philosophy tries to do ever since Socrates is to remind you of things you actually already know and that you don't know that Recalling. you know. Recalling. Yeah, recollection is the perfect image for it. So I think um, what, what, you, what you try to do is engage, I mean, you, it's like the psychoanalyst again. You can't give somebody an analysis. You can just keep talking until some light goes on. And it's a source of great inspiration that when you're teaching a class, when the light goes on, you see it. You see it happen. Right. That's enough to keep you going. Thank you, Professor. Sure. I hope this uh, makes some of our audience's light go on. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Thanks for watching my interview. If you want to go even deeper into these ideas, then go join my email list at greatbooks.io. You'll not only get lectures and interviews, 
but also transcripts, book summaries, and essays, all to help you understand the most important ideas in history. Now, if you like this interview and you want to learn more about Nietzsche, then you should definitely check out one of his most important books, The Genealogy of Morality. The genealogy's thesis is that everything you've learned to call morality, equality, altruism, compassion, moderation, are values designed to suffocate greatness. If you want to learn why Nietzsche thought so, and how he came to hold these values in the first place, then go check out my lecture on the genealogy. You can find links to everything we touched upon today in the description, as well as on my website, greatbooks.io. Thank you.